So what Parseval's theorem says is that if you have the Fourier series for two functions, you have Fourier series for f of x given by series n equals minus infinity to infinity a n e to the i n x. And for another function, g of x, equal to same sum b n e to the i n x, then the following property is true. Then we have that the integral 1 over 2 pi from minus pi to pi f of x and then g bar of x where this bar denotes the complex conjugate dx uh, is given by the following series n equals minus infinity to infinity a n b n bar okay so this is kind of this is kind of cool and maybe a bit surprising because we're saying that if we if we if we multiply these two functions together and integrate, then that's just equal to a sum involving the coefficients. Okay, that's kind of, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty cool. That's a nice way of representing some series, but how do we prove this thing? How, how do we actually show that this thing's true? And, it, and it's actually not too hard to do. It just requires a little, a little, little know-how with integration. Ah, so let's get started. And let's start with this term right here. So. So, so I'm going to try and start from this term and show that this term is equal to this term. Uh, so we have our, our integral that we're starting with. And then instead of writing f of x and g bar of x here, I'm going to substitute in their series. So I'm going to say that we have sum n from minus infinity to infinity a n e to the i n x and then g bar here, but for g bar, I'm going to, I'm going to change this index here, just so that way we don't have a bunch of n's everywhere. I'm going to say uh, m equals minus infinity, m equals minus infinity to infinity, b m bar e to the minus i m x. And, and so you see that I took the complex conjugate here by putting a bar over b m and then a minus sign in this, in this exponential. And then we have dx. Okay. Uh, that's great, um, but we can simplify this a little bit, and or we can rewrite it in a way that's maybe a bit more uh, illuminating. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to notice all right, well, our integrals only with respect to dx, and so we can pull out these sums and this a n and b m, uh, and then just integrate integrate those exponentials. And so, and so what, what does that actually look like? That looks like one over two pi. We have our two sums and going from minus infinity to infinity and some going from m equal minus infinity to infinity. And then we have what? We have a n b m bar. Then our integral minus pi to pi e to the i n x e to the minus i m x d x. Okay. Uh, looking good, looking good. Now all we have to do is evaluate this integral right here. And this integral actually ends up being uh, one, one, a very important integral in terms of all of, all of Fourier analysis because what this integral uh, is, and, and actually I'll, I'll, I'll work through it on the next page. Um, I mean, th this integral in itself is probably one of the fundamental prerequisites for all of Fourier analysis. And so let, let me um, let me do it some respect and actually integrate it. And so I'll, I'll integrate 1 over 2 pi integral minus pi to pi e to the i n x e to the minus i m x dx. All right, uh, I've talked up this integral. Let's actually do it. So what, what happens? We're going to get um, and I'll just combine these first to make things a little easier. We're going to have e to the i x n minus m dx. Okay, this is an easy integral to do. What are we going to get? We're going to get 1 over 2 pi. Then we're going to get an i n minus m times e to the i x n minus m evaluated from minus pi to pi. 
okay, great. So when we when we evaluate that, what we're gonna get, we're gonna get e to the i pi n minus m. Everything's gonna be over two pi i n minus m. And then we're gonna be subtracting what e to the minus i pi n minus m. Haha, well wait a minute, this is just this is just a complex exponential way of writing sine. You'll, you'll recall that you'll recall that uh, sine is equal to, oops, uh, sine sine of x is equal to e to the i x minus e to the minus i x over two i. So this whole this whole expression right here simplifies nicely. It simplifies down to uh, well, what's going to happen? We're going to have sine of pi times n minus m all over, so the two i is gonna go away and we have pi n minus m. Okay, so what's gonna happen here? Well, we have a few cases. One case is what happens if n is not equal to m? And we know n and m are integers, right? So if n and m are not equal to each other, so if this is not equal to zero, then what's gonna happen? Well, we're gonna have sine of pi times an integer that's not zero. Uh, so we're gonna get zero because sine is equal to uh, zero at multiples of pi, at integer multiples of pi. Okay, that, that's easy. So it's, it seems like this should always be zero because uh, I mean, whether n and m are the same or they're different or, or there's something arbitrary, this is always gonna be some integer, right? And so this should always be equal to zero up top. But then we have to look at the denominator. For n equals to m, we get zero on the de in the denominator as well. So in, in the case where n equals m, or, or, or I guess I'll, I'll say it like this, we're gonna get zero for sure for n not equal to m because we're gonna have sine of zero over some constant and that's gonna be zero. But for n equal to m, what happens? We have zero over zero. So then, okay, well, zero over zero, I don't know what that is. Uh, how, how do we figure out? How do we, how do we figure it out? Well, in this case, it's actually not too bad. We can do a L'Hopital's rule and we can say, all right, uh, we can say we want to do a L'Hopital's rule for when we have sine x over pi x in the limit where x is going to zero. And what happens if we use L'Hopital's rule? We're going to get uh, we're going to get pi uh, derivative of sine is cosine cosine of pi x over pi, aha. Now it's easy, we see that when x is equal to zero, this is equal to one. Okay, now this, this is pretty interesting, right? So this, this integral up here, which just looked like some normal integral, when we evaluate it, is going to be equal to one when n is equal to m and zero otherwise. And so one way that people like to write that which I which I like to write is that um, this is equal to the Kronecker delta, and th this Kronecker delta is just defined such that if n is equal to m, you get one, and if m is not equal to n, then you get zero. And what, one way that people like to think about this is just sort of like a uh, kind of like the identity matrix, where if if you're on the diagonal or if 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 your m is equal to your n, you get one; otherwise, you get zero. Okay. Um, that was neat, and, and this is actually very deep in Fourier analysis for, for reasons I'll explain in, in another video. Uh, but, we, I mean, we're, we, we have a specific problem right here, so let's, let's apply that now. So we, we, we just saw that, uh, we, just, we just solved this integral. We saw that it was equal to, uh, we saw that it was equal to, Oh well, yeah, so what do we see? So we, so we saw that one over two pi times this integral is gonna be give us um, the Kronecker delta. So this whole thing simplifies to uh, the same two sums. The sums didn't change. But now we have a n b bar m times this delta m n. And so what, what's gonna happen now? So, I mean, we have these two sums, we have these two terms, and then we have this constraint that m has to be equal to m. And so what does that mean? That means that this sum is going to simplify significantly because most of the terms aren't going to have n equal to m. But we know that those are going to be equal to zero. 
So we can actually rewrite this now as a single sum because there's only one term that we have to iterate over, the term where these two indices are the same. That is the term where we're going from n equal minus infinity to infinity, a n b n bar. And now we've, we've caught it. By, by evaluating this one integral, we are able to reduce this, this double series to a single series, which exactly matches the result that we want. And so we've done it, we've, we've proven Parseval's theorem. Boom.